There's an old adage you'll probably have heard at some point. You wait ages for a bus, and then two come along at once. In the case of cinema, it's more likely to be a pair of exploding White Houses than late public transport. It's a phenomenon known as twin films, where two features with near-identical premises release side by side, and it's been causing option paralysis for over 80 years. Do I want my bureaucratic mishap to result in a nuclear holocaust, or a darkly funny nuclear holocaust? Which band of digitally animated ants will save their colony? Who do I want to stop an apocalyptic asteroid? Robert Duvall or Bruce Willis? Some see it as a cynical game of chicken between rival film studios, others as dire proof that Hollywood is bereft of original ideas. Both of those are probably true to an extent, but there's also the matter of unfortunate coincidence. August 1999 saw the release of a simple story about a young boy in his jaded ward reckoning with the ethereal horrors beyond our living world. Initial adult scepticism gives way to terrifying visions as both attempt to put things right, allowing these wandering spirits to finally rest. September 1999 saw the release of a simple story about a young boy in his jaded ward reckoning with the ethereal horrors beyond our Shit. The Sixth Sense was a box office sensation and cultural behemoth elevated to classic status seemingly overnight. Big twists became the de facto denouement for any horror seeking that word of mouth buzz, it was spoofed to the point of nausea, and launched the frequently indulgent dog shit that is M. Night Shyamalan's career. Stir of Echoes did okay, took a bow, and all but slid down the drain of overlooked ulcerans, which is a real shame, because it's arguably the superior work. Based on the 1958 novel A Stir of Echoes by Richard Matheson, we follow Tom and Maggie, a blue-collar couple raising their son Jake in a close-knit community. After undergoing hypnosis, Tom starts to see beyond our plane of existence, with stark visions hinting towards a festering secret below their well-kept suburban dream. Together with his equally attuned son, Tom sets out to solve the mystery behind these prophetic nightmares before he's consumed by them. It sounds rote when you plot it out. A haunted house, a skeptic turned believer, and a kid who can see dead people, but it's an airtight exercise in doing a lot with a little. Stir of Echoes shares some screen lineage with the heavy hitters of paranoid American dads. The Shining and its psychically afflicted son, and close encounters with a father's slow descent into obsession are both inarguable influences on this translation. Forget CGI contortions, explosions of gore, and loud sonic stabs, this is a murder mystery where the witness is crying out from beyond her shallow grave. By treating the supernatural as the moral toothache slowly eating away at a family's brick and mortar existence, the audience isn't just frightened for their lives, we're concerned for their way of life. The restless ghost drifting in between daydreams and doubtful moments is Samantha, a murdered young woman using Tom and Jake as receivers for her post-mortem distress. What's fascinating is how Stir of Echoes treats this ghostly presence. Ghosts typically fall into the role of antagonistic threat. Obviously, there are exceptions, most notably out with horror, but here her persistence is understandable rather than upsetting. Samantha is neither violent nor vengeful, the very few moments of perceivable menace are relatable frustration rather than aggression, the desperate pleas of a soul in search of peace. Her threat is only to the fallacy of a neighbourhood, quite literally, built on decay. When Tom becomes lost in scattered visions of her death, their brutal imagery isn't mere bloodletting for the baying audience. If you're squeamish, look away now. Okay, you can come back. Stir of Echoes isn't interested in racking up a body count or glorifying violence, it's wince-inducing and difficult to watch. It's indignity and malice a constant presence. The filmmakers will not reward our morbid curiosity with sensationalised violence against a young woman. While there's a certain satisfaction in following the clues to their unnatural conclusion, we aren't owed any sense of relief when we get there. A character detail that sets this apart from so many other protagonist-comes-mentally-undone narratives is the vocal transparency Tom, Maggie, and Jake share. Tom doesn't lie about his premonitions, Jake innocently shares his medium-like relationship with Samantha's spirit, 
and Maggie actually believes her family's outlandish claims. It sells the idea of a codependent family unit, not a collection of characters reacting to bumps in the night. These visions driving Tom, replete with disorientating edits, tie into the wider themes of how we communicate and how we avoid it. By withholding important information and obscuring it behind veiled layers of obtuse weirdness, it's both effectively stringing along the whodunit mystery and teaching our protagonist to look beyond his own purview. Too often this style of editing is employed as stylistic screen-fucking to set the audience off balance, but when used effectively, such as here and clear visual influence Jacob's Ladder, it serves the narrative beyond the need for flustered exposition. With our witness unable to speak, visual cues become key when deciphering the information we're presented. From costume and production design, to the colour grading of the footage itself, Stir of Echoes employs colour psychology to reiterate themes touched on more overtly in the screenplay. This entails not only our relationship with colours in our everyday life, but how they make us feel. Death and encroaching ethereal presences are defined by bluish tones. From the inciting incident onwards, Tom and Maggie's outfit choices favour blue, while Jake's room is cast in a similarly bluish light. In fact, there's a washed out blue palette to most scenes that feature either Samantha or her influence, mirroring her blue lipped, lifeless presence. Red is used to warn of danger or the onset of a premonition. Red cars and lights lead the way to the initial hypnosis scene and the first of many premonitions. The constant glow of Jake's baby monitor and the maroon shirt worn by someone who we maybe shouldn't trust hints at danger to come, while more unavoidable warnings begin to flash on the screen, stripping all but ominous reds and blacks from the image. The obvious association with blood is also there, notably in this grisly premonition, signifying both an impending suicide attempt and the person's complicity in Samantha's death. Beyond a murder mystery and comment on the importance of communication, there's a prevailing fear burrowing through the film. The fear of change and our inability to stop it. The setting of an insular community, all block parties, cookouts and football games, embodies this rigid adherence to ways of old. A street that seems apprehensive about anyone beyond their borders, suspecting and fearful of anything that may seem to upset the order of things. We open with Maggie revealing she's pregnant, which immediately establishes an imminent shifting of the status quo. From here on out, nothing will be the same. Harry, who acts as a landlord and real estate mogul, seems completely unaware of the hypocrisy he represents. He is motivated to buy up the neighbourhood and conceal the murder of Samantha so as to avoid change, while remaining completely ignorant to his own stature as the face of gentrification. Harry is profiting from this fantasy of an idyllic existence that he himself has bought up and sold back at a premium. Frank, another of Tom's friends responsible for covering up Samantha's death, has perhaps the most telling and desperately sad moment of the film. He helplessly utters, This is a decent neighbourhood. While sat above Samantha's uncovered remains, innocents buried to preserve the illusion of a community wrapped in plastic and bricked up amongst the foundations. In the end, even as we pack up and leave behind the events of the film, there's a sting in the tail. As Jake peers through the window at the passing houses, each bearing an uncanny resemblance to that he's just left, the sound is drowned out by the restless muttering of the dead. What we've witnessed isn't an isolated incident, and some things never change. Whether it's been a while or you've never seen it at all, I'd highly recommend you track down and watch Stir of Echoes. Feel free to share these videos on Reddit or Twitter or wherever the kids commune to do the internet, and we'll be back soon with another video. Until next time, this is In Frame Out. Out.